Welcome back to Cloud Computing and Big Data, our lecture four, Virtualization and Data Center Design, part two. So we will talk a little bit about cloud data center design today in this part two, but in part one, we already reviewed a little bit the virtualization techniques, and they are really a key ingredient as part one will actually show to the idea of how we manage now cloud data center designs we will discuss in part two. So in one respect, you would even say the scalability, the multi-user environment, the efficiency, uh, the, the economics of scale in large um, would be not possible with cloud data center if it would be not fueled by virtualization techniques that we reviewed in the first part of the lecture. We understand a little bit that you know hardware is there, of course, always in a physical manner. And this will not change, right? There's no magic that we suddenly don't need really CPUs. We don't need GPUs anymore in storage and so on. And most notably also for a cloud data center, we need network interconnect, also very important. And we will make a case for it in part two. Hence, the virtualization gives basically an abstraction layer on physical hardware, but still the physical hardware will be important. However, what virtualization enables you is in a way a user-oriented view on the hardware a very specialized um, leveraging of this hardware for certain applications. And then, of course, you can share this you know, physical hardware that you have with many different virtualized user communities. And this enables, of course, in the idea of thinking much more broader than perhaps your little laptop and so on. So cloud data center is really you know, using this virtualization design and the virtualization techniques to the most let's say significant degree if you want to really enable then high efficiency of the data center uh, where people using it maybe 99.9% 9 of the time, the underlying hardware, and this will be an important cost factor. So we will review in part two now several different pieces, but we assume that many of you will know what virtualization really entails. We also gave, of course, a short remark that this is not a, you know, operating system course in the university, like our course here today, or distributed systems, where elements of virtualization are much more deeply, let's say, teached. We here just gave a very, let's say, short introduction to understand really the cloud data center at scale design much better. So let us review a little bit and go better into this data center terminology. Right, let's stay, start a little bit with the idea you probably already know, an off-the-shelf cluster somewhere or server, maybe even a very, very small resource, um, having, of course, a multi-core CPU and some internal cache hierarchies and so on. But this is something where you would say um, that's where it all starts. It still needs, of course, ingredients from it, right? So when we talk about now, however, that we have the server machine that is often available, also maybe in smaller SMEs and smaller companies, we find this in the cellar, maybe in public organizations. But when we talk about server clusters, we have to see that this hardware is still here and there, maybe very similar, um, but it's differently designed in so-called racks, right? And this means different of these servers are not really anymore in these boxes there, in these smaller boxes, they're in these larger boxes we call racks. And they're note cards, they're different ingredients where the hardware is much more, let's say, densely integrated into the racks than having, let's say, many of these servers to be interconnected. On top of it, these racks usually have a very good uh, you know, network interconnect, something we will also discuss throughout part two here, where these racks are really, uh, for certain reasons, a complete different designs. Because you can imagine if you have this hardware so dense together, uh, let's say many CPUs on a very, very small space together, it will generate a lot of heat. Hence, if you have no drone cameras on some of the big data centers and going over it, and drone cameras feature already some a little bit on heat, you know, cameras, you will see there's lots of heat generated, and those usually come from racks. Hence, some have also cooling strategies um, you will have, you know, lots of ventilation, but also these days we have even actually hot water cooling. Uh, it's an interesting name and, and where basically you can see that this water then maybe even can fuel other districts with energy of really heating them. So they, this is a whole loaded industry today, how you create this racks, 
how you create really interesting note cards, which then will also stand the test of times. But the key message to take away is really, we don't take the things you know, and then, you know, combine many of those. We rather have very interesting vendors that already thought about the integration. We call them sometimes also integrators. They still use GPUs from NVIDIA. They still use Intel CPUs, etc. But they condense that on a very short and little space, you would say, like racks, which are certain technology really of uh, offering us a lot of, lot of different technology benefits. And then on those servers, you would rather think Apache Spark would be feasible, right? So this is then bringing us again to this virtual um, sort of, let's say, nice view I gave you on the cluster coming much more to the rack philosophy. Right, where you think like, okay, if that's your cluster with lots of different resources, now you feel a little bit, okay, these racks could fuel this Apache Spark cluster. And we can add a rack, we can remove a rack, we can maybe ha add half a rack, depending on how much you know CPUs we want. You remember the workstations we allocated for the Spark cluster were costly, but with this also very flexible. I could ask for 20, right, instead of just four or two, as we did in the course, a little bit for managing the costs. Hence, this technology is, is a big element fueling today also these large data centers that maybe uh, I think most of you have already seen somewhere in the media, right? Like Microsoft here with 100 data centers around the world. Um, you will see here an example. I think this is around 10 times a football field or so, right? So the size is massive enabling us something we called economics of scale. Since when you have racks together, you need to cool, cool them. You need to have fuel available in order to fuel so-called um, USPs. We will talk about this. You know, they will also keep operating with diesel engines when maybe the original uh, energy provider will be going out of service. You will have that basically co-located either in a, let's say, cold climate, that's what we do in Iceland, but also you can, of course, co-locate this with a big dam that is generating, you know, kind of a lot of energy. Or if you want also to Jülich, where I'm, you know, having my second hat on, so to speak, in the Jülich Supercom Center, being close to the coal power plant, which maybe is not the biggest greenest like we have in Iceland, but still gives you maybe better energy prices. In other words, the bigger, the better, in a sense, from the economics of scale. And hence, we see in the last 10 years a significant growth of the megawatts, um, you know, that these, you know, basically centers really need for operating uh, in terms of energy. And with this, of course, uh, offering us as a user then interesting economics of scale. So it's getting cheaper and cheaper in a way to operate than within a data center because they're getting bigger, bolder, better operated and so forth. So we look at this a little bit more into detail. Um, how that now would look like if you want to extract from it a little bit again. So what we just saw on the nice big picture is nothing else than having different physical clusters you see here that you basically combine in this large halls or if you want even across different data centers, right? So this could be also the case that one is in Europe, one is maybe in the US and one is somewhere in Asia. So Important for us, again, to make the connection now to the virtualization we had in the first part is that you can not, you know, basically offer now this physical cluster to a user. Instead, what you do is you virtualize it. You have a virtual machine manager underneath that then operates for the user as a virtual cluster. And you see that a little bit how that works with different, let's say, facets, how you basically can use that. And you see here the virtual cluster one is shared between different physical clusters for several reasons. Then one of the virtual clusters is just completely fo focused on physical cluster one. Could be, for instance, data co-located. Physical cluster one offers us a certain data sets, let's say from the earth science domain. Hence, our virtual cluster three with the application wants to be co-located. Another one, virtual cluster four, might be in Europe of saying I have several security constraints which actually needs that I have to be adhered to the European GDPR, the general you know, data protection regulation. So I need a cluster that is situated in Europe. So this physical cluster two in Europe, as an example, would be the one to serve me, not the others. And then you can maybe, of course, think about different scenarios where the, even you need the whole physical cluster three, right? There should be a little bit of this graphic here, only parts of it. And 
this would be the same way how you know create an Apache Spark cluster, for instance, right? That's why I put always Apache Spark as an example, because you already know it from previous lectures. Hence, you could think of that these also different, you know, Spark clusters I created, for instance, in HD Insight, saying I need it in Europe. You remember in our exam, uh, sorry, in our assignment, and also in our um, practical lecture 3.1, we had the US central position. So this could be, you know, cluster three, running then this HD Insight cluster on some physical resource. But in the end, we could also think that a physical resource might be even shared across many different possibilities and creating this virtual cluster one, which would be then again possible with different worker nodes and so on. So hence a very flexible technology and enables us a bit load balancing. It is enabling us a replication st stream where you can then think that, um, you know, basically an application is stretched across um, with this virtual cluster among many, many different, let's say, location and has then also, of course, always workloads here from different application areas. And if one would fail, it would be much more easier possible to really live migrate again um, and working essentially without one of these nodes because it helping us then to be more resilient, to be more error, let's say, um, wall tolerant, and it enables us even to work against disaster recovery. Let's say there's a hurricane in one data center uh, or close to it has to stop operating. So hence we can move and migrate the workload again by having this virtual cluster nodes to just move to another virtual cluster node, which is very similar, running effectively, of course, in a totally different location and also another physical hardware. But the VMM again, the virtual machine manager, you know, from part one is enabling us now to much more do this live migration or the, let's say, um, possibility to restart a VM based on the status of before in another cluster uh, in physical space. Although this is all virtualized, this makes it much more easier. So you have many different functionality, you have a great application flexibility that comes with it. And this, of course, is something now where you have to think about, um, do I really want this? from a terms of, you know, owner of resources versus just using services. So what now is to be understood a little bit is the cost rational of all of this. So when, of course, you think about this a traditional IT cost model, there's a big company, um, let's say here somewhere in Iceland that would have their own service in the basement, right? So hence they have this equipment bought, they have a, let's say, interesting set of machines and racks somewhere in the cellar which is sort of a fixed um, price. And then, of course, the more and the bigger the system is, you have a sort of variable cost that goes with the operation expenses. You have still to employ, um, of course, lots of different people that have to exchange the hardware, let's say, in terms of overheating. You have to have some maintenance of operating systems to be updated, security patches, whatever it is to keep the operation going. You have this variable cost. But, of course, now when you think about the cloud computing cost model, the way how it would would see it is to to fight a little bit this fixed cost that you actually used in in buying the software. You know we have seen pay per use. We have seen the HD Insight cluster using Apache Spark. We pay basically the more worker nodes we have, and with this maybe the more number of users we want to give access to the Spark cluster in variable costs. And this is something per hour, per month, etc. We don't really pay for a real GPU, CPU down in the basement somewhere at Amazon or basically at MS Asia from HD Insight. Hence, we save that cost somehow. And in a way, this was giving rise to cloud computing. So firstly, you don't have to have, you know, big upfront costs, you know, lots of investor money, what you would have in the traditional IT cost model to even got the resources first and then you start operating. Here you can start from basically zero, right? Um, you're swiping your credit card. You can use it as an SME. You maybe even get good deals these days that you don't have to pay in the beginning, right? So the operation expenses would be quite low in the beginning and maybe exponential go up. However, this graph also explains that you have, of course, some learning to do from people in your company. So I think it's, it's still a very good representation. Hence, the cloud computing cost model was enabling us with, without big upfront capital expenses, investor money to use already cutting edge resources. 
On the other hand, also um, at the same end of the scale, if you want, if you have all of these resources, let's say you bought it in the basement in the traditional IT cost model, and you bought, for instance, Kepler uh, GPUs from NVIDIA a couple of years ago, um, they were still okay, were not maybe top-notch, like maybe Volta was, but still did the job. And now you want to have suddenly, uh, you know, something more like Ampere or Hopper cards in NVIDIA. Hence, there's a sort of upgrade to new technology costs, which also is actually uh, affecting this model again. So hence, cloud computing and the cost models with pay-per-use was also giving you the opportunity, of course, to pay a little bit more. But with this, you don't have to, let's say, decommission your old cluster and buy a complete new cluster for upgrading to new technologies. You just basically have a drop-down bottom, as you have seen in HD Insight, of switching what type of CPU or GPU I want. And then, of course, I, I go there and pay the price for it. It's not that this is totally transparent. We have seen the differences in terms of HD Insight, for instance, of CPUs with lots of memory versus those with less memory while we know that we need much memory to really leverage Spark. Hence, this was something, of course, which uh, in a way revolutionized computing and brought us to the cloud computing cost models. Also, then bringing in a little bit the idea of shrinking down and up, right? As you didn't bought the, the kind of cluster, you didn't have this capital expenses, you can also think that the you know number of users maybe at some point in time goes lower again, so I can also reduce my costs of, you know, release again some work nodes from Spark. Instead of 10, I maybe just use four my, for my users because in some respect, this is just a couple of months where they're not using our infrastructure so much. Uh, let's say, for instance, over December, because just half of December people are working because of Christmas and so on. So there are different ways uh, where this was really good for industry, for dynamic elements in startups, in SMEs, to think about, um, you can start right away, no upfront cost, and you can grow and shrink with the you know demand. And <clears throat> this is a little bit more the metrics that then also show, as we would say sometimes also in machine learning, the data speaks for itself, right? So you would have a certain base of server, uh, physical server installations that you need as a data center then, but then of course, um, uh, this means for large and small data centers, there are thousands and hundreds of these different servers, right? And then the um, kind of the the aspect is, of course, that you have more, more logical servers. So that's what we just discussed, virtualized, right, resources, which we also then see the virtualization management gap because physical server installed will be, you know, getting not so much popular again. Again, you have to do on the logical scale much more thinking about benefits, right? So there's a Spark installation we discussed, for instance, in HD Insight again, which was already clear with all the versions. It was already configured in a way with Zookeeper, so to keep in track of two different head nodes. You have several worker nodes up and down. So lots of the elements that you usually, you know, have to manage on a physical resource were already included in the logical one. Of course, this means costs for some administrators in the data center, and hence, we see a sort of also increased in that, right? So by more and more installing these servers. Then, however, on the cost breakdown, um, this is an interesting factor, especially now if you think about Iceland, I will come to this in a couple of slides, that you can see the cost breakdown now, when you want to understand this diagram a little bit more and what is now the point of having physical versus logical, but then also about the overall data center we have seen right, 10 so soccer fields. So how is that working in terms of costs? And here's one example where you say, in the end, all the IT equipment and all of that, what we have seen is just making out one third of the cost, right, 30%, roughly. So then the infrastructure for cooling it, and now the key point, right, cooling it, energy, right, chillers, but also the emergency power. So UPS, we come to this in a moment, what a you know, this, this power supply is, um, air conditioning, right? All of this is sort of um, important elements of a data center that add up and up and up, and then power distribution, etc. So these factors, <clears throat> is really now important to recognize that majority of the cost is not really the IT equipment itself, 
It's rather the the big ecosystem that you have as a data center, hence the economics of scale, right? So when you have a very large room that is already cooled down, you extend it and it will be cooled as well. Instead of putting it maybe at different areas and then cool down different locations, the bigger the system is, you also have the infrastructure in place, the UPS operators and so on. Hence, this cost breakdown helps us to understand why the big data centers, as they're called today, really have a, a point because they enable this you know, economics of scale being often also co-located, let's say, with a big dam or so and lots of hydropower and things like that. What we do also in Iceland, right? We will come to an example of the uh, Blendos Verkun, if you want, which enables us also have a Blendos um, data center being actually viewed by different two hydro resources. So basically, this is an important, interesting thing to consider as well. And when you think about the infrastructure costs and summarizing this a little bit, you see that around 60% of the cost to run the data centers really more or less all the management and maintenance of the infrastructure. Hence, the it's not just buying this particular CPU and memory and so on. It's rather keeping it running, um, you know, water, cooling, chillers. Um, you have even fuel sometimes, diesel fuel for this UPS that you have to be prepared. And, and this is something which, of course, uh, explains a little bit why Iceland is now so competitive in this data center industry. I'm sure some of you have heard from it, right? At North, Borealis data centers, even at Vanya, Thor. Um, there's a big data center, Vern Global, uh, at Keplavik Airport, very close to it, where the old NATO base was. So this is a growing industry in Iceland. And hence, I have here a slide of you showing us a little bit of activities driving this in in Iceland as a business, right? You see me here, uh, for instance, at the supercomputing 2021. It was not the best one because we had a you know, COVID time still, if you remember a little bit about it. So we're running around with masks a lot. But still, it captures the essence that the data centers in Iceland united and also the, let's say, collaborating vendors united, like energy companies here, together with Borealis data centers at North, a big provider, not only in Iceland, or across Scandinavia, Borealis data center has, for instance, a Kayani data center in Finland, uh, which is also, let's say, hosting our Lumi supercomputer that we have in the Euro HPC systems. They are part of Business Iceland, this kind of data center association combined with different stakeholders. We call it a so-called public-private partnership that really align under the goal of saying we want to promote, you know, Iceland's, in, you know, 100% uh, electric um, green electricity, you know, sort of benefit around geothermal and hydropower, and then basically enables this to have one front for the customers. And I think this video that I provided you here shows you a little bit the benefits in a very condensed fashion, doing a little bit of marketing for Iceland. I hope you don't are angry about this because this is, of course, also an Icelandic lecture series, and we work with many of these partners you see on the left on a daily basis. So let's see what the marketing has to offer here for, you know, basically promoting Icelandic data centers. short video that you find on YouTube, of course, also much more information. But the interesting thing to take away is really that there are consulting firms looking at this, foreign consulting firms and foreign experts that taking all the different, um, let's say, properties of a data center in count, you would be quite astonished to think that Iceland is still one of the best places for data and compute, even if you're running Volcano next door. But this 
has something to do also with political stability being in the European Union or more notably in the EEA. We're not EU, we're directly, you know, the European Economic Area, which has lots of deals under EFTA with the EU, but still being politically friendly, so to speak, while the US is a complete gray zone for many companies in the EU. And then, of course, you have seen lots of this has to do with electricity. I think this is clear, geothermal, hydroelectric, um, for those of you who have been in the countryside, see this already while driving on the highways, the smoke coming out here and there. And notably also is, I think, the expertise. So these people are not just people that come from the travel industry and tourism industry and think, let's build a big data center. So many of these people that build these data centers, operate these data centers, have a well-proven skill set and offer you a tool set uh, with an interesting mindset of green energy, really. So especially for any companies, get in touch maybe with, you know, Borealis data center with their ice cloud that you see as one product, but also responsible compute you see here has been um, actually created by Borealis and Origo together, for example, to, to really combat the idea of going to non-green resources or so really promote people to use green resources like in the Rescale platform if you use then the Icelandic resources under responsible compute, you see a green leaf. And this is something, of course, in the future, with all the legal framework coming on about, you know, companies reporting about carbon footprints and so on. This is, of course, something which, in a sense, is more notably um, important in the future, as it is already starting today, really, that people, of course, think about the carbon footprint. And here, the green energy in Iceland has lots of things to offer. So in this sense, I also want to say that uh, in previous um, years of this course, we always were looking at a data center ourselves. So the last time we have been to the Borealis data centers, for instance, in the Reykjavik area. So my aim is to organize this again, to visit a real data center here in Iceland. Um, I'm not sure exactly when we will do this. Obviously, that depends also on their availability, right? So um, we don't pay anything for it. So basically, we, we are just guests in this sense. We have to see how their availability is, but we will do this hopefully also very soon in the course that you get a real, let's say, view on a data center because the data center is different in operating. And that's why we come to this now when we think about more technology aspects about it. Um, and one of that is, again, thinking about how everything evolves in terms of Different technologies, the case I made earlier, right? A Kepler, you maybe have, you know, created in, in, and then basically over the years it will evolve to Pascal architecture or Volta architectures or NVIDIA Ampere. Now we have the Grace Hopper cards and, and the energy efficiency and the, as he called here, inference efficiency for maybe AI workloads or so has uh, uh, amazingly increased also per watts. Hence, in, in one respect, you can see that the move to different GPU architectures is even a green move. So it's getting more and more energy efficient. In other words, also NVIDIA thinks about their design of the key cards they have that you see here in the graph of being more and more energy efficient. And, uh, and of course, on top of this comes all the data movement. It is also another power consumption element um, that has to be always taken into account and hence, these cards have these days also lots of HBM, um, you know, lots of memory, very specialized memory and so on that we actually discuss more in the high performance computing course because more, let's say, um, really architecture component related than the high level cloud computing course. But it's important for you to understand that not only the power, you know, green power elements come now from the location like Iceland, et cetera, or generally the Nordics in Finland with Kajani or so. It's also that the technology itself is moving more and more to green levels. And this is necessary because if you remember what I said in the first um, part of this course is that we are now hosting an exascale system in Jülich very shortly. It's called Jupiter. And this means a lot, a lot of computing power and this is something where you have to consider if you're not living next to a dam or hydropower or geothermal power plant and you have a coal power plant, you have to do a responsible you know, usage with all of these resources. And with this comes also the drive today to really do it energy efficient. There's a green 500 list, for instance, also. Um, but again, our HPC course talks much more about this very hardware oriented elements. I want to go a little bit again more to the cloud computing course here 
Now think about services, think about data centers as a whole. And one of the things we discussed already before was this resilience idea, right? This a bit differentiates us from some HPC workloads. For instance, we said like Apache Spark, Hadoop has this wall tolerance inside. So if there's something failing, we resubmit the job. Hence, these these cloud data centers, and you see here Google Cloud Data Center uh, from the inside that is not so much, you know, basically very different probably from the Microsoft one you have seen from the outside. Lots of lots of racks, lots of lots of infrastructure. We will talk about this as well. So there are pipes, there are networks uh, across them. And more notably, you think now that everything inside these racks is, of course, still something you know. It's a CPU, there are lots of disk arrays and networks that can fail, right? So hardware fails and 1% and, and of nodes is common, as you see. So think about it, it's a very large number of nodes. Hence, this is quite some substantial value. And, and with this sense, um, this means that an error can occur every point in time. And now when you basically design these data centers, you have to really assume failure from the front. And this has something to do with the hardware in one respect. So you mark basically hardware as being not usable anymore. And you have, have certain maintenance windows where the hardware itself gets exchanged by people. There's an interesting video I brought you also later in the course that you can look here in the particular lecture. But the key message to take away is that there will be always like some errors within the data center. And then, of course, think about a power crash happening next door or a hurricane, as I was alluding to, that maybe actually then enables even um, the, the, the interesting situations where a complete data center goes offline. Hence, you need replication schemes, multiple copies of data, perhaps also in different locations, right? So if you think about a hurricane intensive region, where hopefully the data center has mirrored all its data somewhere else, et cetera, et cetera. And these are the things we are just more or less discussing in the course. Again, also under the umbrella of Spark in the beginning, we said already the Apache Spark engine is ready for this. If one job would be failing, they would automatically start really jobs to combat that and will start another job to really make the job finished. And the same is true with the Hadoop and also then the replication elements that you need for the data maybe to operate on, which is given by the Hadoop distributed file system that admittedly we left out, but we will follow suit very quickly with this um, also in our next lecture, basically on Thursday. So you will see that also this distributed file system assumes failure by default and is ready for it. And this is a key element also in this cloud computing area. Um, and you can imagine how this is solved partly also underneath then this, again, virtualization techniques. Coming then a little bit to an interesting word we didn't touch upon yet before, um, what happens if there's a fall? Let's say electricity goes down, right? Um, and you have a very remote region somewhere, but very fruitful region still, maybe in terms of, you know, location price. And suddenly the energy goes down. Your users are using it. You still have network connectivity, so the users can access it. You want to have something we call a UPS, an uninterruptible power supply. So although that's sort of still modus operandi in data centers, and you have seen that in the very large one, right? In the very beginning where I said there's a big diesel tank and there are four, I think, or five of these. Um, this getting more and more tough to really compensate to the high computing, right? So you need more and more power generators really to come up with all the watts uh, that you have here. So I think here, Blendos, for instance, you have 100 megawatts as a potential um, capacity, right? If you want to keep operating on that, just with diesel operators, you have to install very many and you have to have the diesel fuel to operate them 24 seven. So hence, this is, just something to keep the data center usually a little bit operational before hopefully the energy is getting back, right? This is not a long-term solution. This is usually something for really, um, you know, deal with fault. And then while this fault is happening, many people try to already to fix it. But it gives also the possibility to think about that not only this UPS is a considerable element now in this grain energy movement to data centers, but also the backup power is that you have here, for instance, if you think about the campus 
um, here again of Blondos, where you think, okay, um, they have two different hydropower plants or hydro, uh, I think, sources next to each other, which are sort of independent. So they have two different green energy resources. So this gives you also opportunities. If one green energy resource will die, let's say one hydropower plant would be not working, they can still then I'll connect to the other, which makes them also quite interesting as a location, um, because then you still don't need the diesel fuel necessarily that you would need in others. And this can, of course, go to high cost as a data center operator. So um, then um, I think the last message I really want to do with this is something uh, kind of short abbreviation related to this, which is called the power usage effectiveness, PUE, you see here. So with all of these considerations also that you have seen before, so cold climate, um, you have basically in Blundos, it's already more to the north of Iceland, quite a climate which uh, is reaching maybe maximum 20 degrees, if so at all, uh, in summer. So it would be constantly not too cold, not too hot. So it's it's a sort of interested interesting temperature level where you can operate data centers quite nicely, keeping the cost of chillers down and things like that. Of, obviously, location is not downtown Reykjavik, so you can expand heavily. And as I was also sa saying earlier, there's a power plant, the Blundos Virkun, um, also a hydropower plant, not far from it. So in this sense, um, what data centers today provide is sort of metrics, which we will review now also for scalability, but also for costs which give you an indicator that, for instance, this particular uh, data center here has one that is almost optimal, right? Close to 1.0, I would say, in terms of the optimal low levels that you can achieve with this low power usage effectiveness, which, of course, is now for reporting carbon footprint for companies, for reporting for data centers, the circular economy factors. Uh, and, and lots of energy in terms of usage, uh, responsible usage, um, this gives you another metric to to deal on, and much more is actually then uh, in in sort of you know in future coming with the regulations of the EU and so on, where you also have to report on these that actually provide you with the resources. But this is basically all I wanted to show you in that area. Let us come a little bit more to the architectures and then to some let's say metrics again. Uh, here, I want to show you just briefly how basically such a data center cooling system could work. You have the racks. I told you earlier, very condensed hardware. So this will very quickly go to red here, really hot air circulated. And in some of the data centers, you would then have them this computer room air conditioning that then turns the, the, the kind of heat again to cool air, which is underneath the second floor. And I brought you a video to understand this a bit better. In these data centers, you don't operate on basically the normal level, right? That you would see as a human being coming usually in sort of a room. There would be, in most of the cases, a sort of second level here introduced where not only you see it's it's relevant for the maybe, you know, heat um, and, and ventilation and air and cool cooling. It would be also the network level that is here, of course, somewhere. So hence, these architectures of the data centers are quite loaded where the server racks stand on, right? And also this on the network design level, this would fill maybe more three, four university lectures. But you see a little bit of our, um, you know, Juvel system in Jülich, how that now in reality could look like. You have lots of lots of cables with these systems, right? While this is loading, you see, a, for instance, an example of a fat tree switch design that if even a, several switches fail, you still have an interconnect basically to all the different elements. So you have all these different racks, they're multiply connected, and you see in the video very nicely the second level here. And, you know, not only this for, let's say, air or something, but lots of lots of cables, right? And these are not only power cables, right? These are also the interconnect that you see here, a little bit about these different switches, that connecting now all these different racks together to make them one big system. Uh, this is, of course, just an example of a supercomputer um, but you can imagine that some of these boxes here that you have in the cloud system uh, somewhere in Amazon are looking almost the same way, right? And some of the videos that I show you later here in YouTube um, basically are also alluding to this factor. And also there, the bigger the system is, we can assume failure almost certain 
of some hardware elements all the time, uh, let it be storage, let it be CPU, whatever, is something to deal with as well. So having seen that, um, the networks, of course, are important. Also now when you think about the user in the cloud has still his own laptop. So you would have something like a, a big disk array to have then the NAS connected to it in several uh, solutions and network storage. But then you have also larger machines that you would have over a LAN um, maybe connected. So in a way, the storage area network and, and the kind of LAN and the network attached storage and all of these are sort of overlapping, giving you a cloud solution um, with commercial network components that you are basically not really seeing, right? In HD Insight, you're sort of assuming all of this. If you remember in HD Insight, we had not only computing for the HD Insight cluster, we also needed to have a storage connected to our subscription in order to be able to use the HD Insight cluster. Good. So coming finally a little bit to the data center metrics, right? So scalability is a very important term, and that's why we bring it up again, just to think about um, that these centers now have to think about these metrics. And scalability is a term now I introduced a lot of times, but you can also see that it's really scalability in different areas of your data center. And one of it is, of course, the size scalability where the cloud essentially stands for, right? You can add, you can remove, you can shrink, you can, etc. you know, your cloud, do this with hardware resources like processors, cache, whatever. Um, and they're all basically, if you want, um, a little bit interconnected and then virtualized. So it's very easy to add more resources or remove more resources. One example would be the underlying resources of our Spark entity. However, then also the software needs to scale for it. So we said like, for instance, mathematical engineering libraries, the machine learning library of Spark, it's ready for scalability, right? So you can use Apache Spark libraries, uh, the MLlib really up and down with different you know, worker nodes. While for instance, if you now use just SkyKit Learn, for instance, as a serial implementation of many interesting algorithms. And I don't say that this package is not interesting. I just say, it has not scalability in mind, right? It works for your local laptop. It works maybe in Google Colab in, in smaller resources, but you cannot scale with SkyKit Learn now a big cluster here. You have to use a machine learning library and so on. So you need a so software scalability inherent in all of these different systems in order to enable really the scalable data center usage, because in the end you have more and more users you have more and more requirements to software to really leverage these resources. And this makes it, of course, also hard for a data center to provide this. And hence, the metrics will be very important for, for doing something in, in terms of you know, supporting then the, the different users. But there are more um, scalability options. While the software scalability was sort of a little bit more on the let's say more general software, let's say machine learning libraries, things like that. You have, of course, also certain application scalability where you would say that, um, you know, now it's it's time for an application of putting more and more storage to it. Um, so we have to, you know, basically scale up and down that this is directly accessible in the application. So you would have certain interfaces that allows us to connect to it like for instance, the S3 interface, where you have one interface, but you can nicely inherently then have the hardware scalability underneath, but the application will never really face that, right? So when you increase the problem size, then um, for instance, of different elements uh, in one respect, you know, we can fill the S3 resources with more and more data, um, the application will scale as well. You maybe probably need more computing, and we have seen the HD Insight application on top of each other. This thing that you implement on the MLlib, maybe with your specific, specific Chicago, you know, we have said food inspection application will also scale up and down with the needs that you have of the different data on all the food violations or food production violation of these restaurants. So in this sense, there's a certain application scalability, and then. The technology scalability stands for all the ideas where we said, well, technology is never fixed, right? So you would say there are new generation CPUs from Intel. There are new, let's say, architectures you have seen that in the diagram from NVIDIA, 
right? While Kepler or Ampere was quite known in the future, uh, in the past, now everybody is screaming suddenly for Hopper architectures. Or while others would say, well, I still fine with Volta architectures because they give you a good, let's say, price performance ratio. So you have to put that all in the idea of being a data center, that you have maybe different types of resources. And that's what you also saw in, in the previous lectures where I sought you, for instance, Amazon for the different prices with the different generations, right? So maybe for some of them, the technology scalability have not to be top notch cutting edge technologies, but really scale maybe still with a number of resources in the technology, but still having, let's say, not the cutting edge resources or use, so to speak, on the spot resources, as we call that sometimes also in the clouds. So very cost efficient opportunities. Hence, um, this is a really heterogeneous environment and not only about one vendor and its different architecture generations like we have with NVIDIA GPUs. You see also today we have AMD, we have other vendors creating GPUs. So we have a quite mixed set of technology. And of course, with this also the industry taking over different vendors, taking over different suppliers and so on. Finally, um, I would just give you a short review again on this. However, we will come back to this significantly in 8, 9, 10. And we discussed it already by a student question in the course. So why on earth when you have this public clouds, which are so well known, like Microsoft Asia, Google App Cloud, Salesforce, Amazon, whatever, why you want to have a private cloud and be motivated, for instance, for security reasons. You could see, for instance, everything which is maybe under EU law with the GDPR in place needs to be processed in the, you know, basically private cloud they have within the internet in the company. And there's some public data I want to basically process um, together with my models and machine learning, uh, which then makes it maybe to this open weather data combined of how much the smelters are used here. So energy data I have, let's say, more internally. But I would combine this, making it more or less a hybrid cloud in order to also do some solutions. Hence, the hybrid clouds are also often use and the further on question that students might have was always like how I create a private cloud and something we will talk uh, about in lecture 14 then when we talk about OpenStack which enables you then really to create an, an own private cloud having all the necessary components and this is a we call the cloud deployment model so it's really very specific to the different let's say organizations at hand the security concern, maybe also the regulation concern in which countries they operate and so on. Hence, this is a loaded topic and we will come back to this again in lecture 8, 9, 10 later on different levels also on infrastructure as a service, platform as a service and software as a service. And this is all I wanted to give you today for the Google Data Center here as an example, maybe just dance perfectly as a video for, for the concerns in all the data centers, really. Um, hence, I would encourage you to look at this, please. And we will continue with lecture five, um, basically, then next week. So thank you very much and talk to you next time.